Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll give it another minute or so, but we're going to start chapter seven today. Before um, we get started, are there any questions about anything that we've done um, so far? We'll have a review again for part of the class on um, Monday for the exam Monday afternoon. Okay, so if there aren't any Questions, let me check the chat. Okay. okay. Then we'll go ahead and get started. So the general form of a substitution reaction is that you're going to have a compound reacting with something. And if it's necessary to indicate, underneath the reaction arrow is going to be the solvent. Now, this species here, this thiol, it could be written up here. Okay, so it can either be listed as a reactant or listed on top of the arrow as the reaction conditions. And then you have a product, and then you essentially have something that ends up being thrown away, trash. So this, when you do a substitution reaction, you have four components that you have to consider. And they're all in this chemical reaction and I'll label them in a minute. The first is that you have to have um, a substrate. That's the thing on which the substitution reaction will occur. Your substrate is an electrophile in the reaction. Okay. The substrate <clears throat> must have a leaving group. So remember, a leaving group from chapter six is a part of the molecule that can break off and be stable as a species on its own. The third thing you're going to use in a substitution reaction is a nucleophile. And you're going to have a choice of the type of nucleophile that you use. All nucleophiles have to have a, at least one lone pair of electrons, but they don't have to be charged. If they are charged, they have to be negative. So you can have a neutral nucleophile or a negatively charged nucleophile. You can never have a positively charged species labeled as an electrophile, excuse me, as a nucleophile. And the fourth component is your solvent. Okay. So when you look at this reaction, this molecule is the substrate. Now, on the substrate, you have this chlorine, which is the leaving group. Okay. Now, sulfur has three lone pairs, so it's in the same group as oxygen. That's the nucleophile. And then in this case, we don't have the solvent specified. Okay. On the right hand side, this is the product. This is the important part of the reaction. And this is essentially trash. 
Okay. So these reactions tend to take place in a solvent so that this species ends up in water because it's negatively charged. And you can put this easily into water. This won't go into water so much. So this compound would stay in an organic solvent. This would transfer to water and then the water is thrown away. So I sometimes forget to write that trash product. It's just because it's not the important part, but for charge balance and law of conservation of mass, it should be there. So what we're going to be doing over the course of chapter seven is we're going to be looking at these four factors. And then we're going to have to decide based on what we have in our uh, reaction scheme, which of two different mechanisms will um, dominate the substitution. Okay, so we're going to go through each one of these um, on its own and then kind of put things together and then at the end of the chapter you'll be able to see a reaction scheme, you'll be able to predict a product, and you'll be able to predict a mechanism that supports the formation of the product. Questions so far? Okay, so there are a few things that you're going to need in this chapter. And they're presented in 7.2, which are called alkyl halides. Now you've already seen alkyl halides in chapter four. So these are going to be alkanes with halogen substituents. So there's two components, there's a naming component. So you should review naming halogen substituted alkanes. That was covered in chapter four. And when you're naming, now you have to always remember to check if the alkyl halide is R or S stereochemistry, which is chapter five. So one of the things with moving along in Chem 211 is that even though like Monday's exam is going to be three, five, and six, you can't, um, as we move into alkyl halides and stuff for exam three, you're going to have to use that same exam two information, naming and stereochemistry, in order to do well on exam three. So you can't really leave exam two behind and you have to carry it through um, for the rest of the semester. So the other thing that we have to consider when we do this reaction, uh, or do these types of reactions, is the type of alkyl halide that we have in the reaction. So we could have So this would be called a methyl alkyl halide. So you only have a single carbon. You can have a primary alkyl halide where the carbon that has the leaving group is bonded to one other carbon. Okay. So in this particular reaction, 
the carbon that's going to participate in the reaction is the carbon bonded to the halide. It's not going to be any of the other carbons surrounding. Okay, a, a secondary alkyl halide will have that reactive carbon bonded to two chlorine, or excuse me, two other carbons and tertiary would have three other carbons. Okay, the nice thing about the substitution reactions is that these two go together. This one goes in a different direction. So these two will follow the same reaction mechanism. This one will participate in the other substitution mechanism. The secondary ones um, can do both. So secondary alkyl halides are the hardest of the group to predict reaction behavior. Okay. So are there questions about some of this basic structural stuff before we start talking about the two mechanisms and how to distinguish them. Okay. <coughs> so 7.3 is the possible mechanisms. Come on. Huh? Oh, you're not talking to me. No. Uh -oh. okay. not all of my dirty clothes are out there. Yeah, my towels are the, in the other one. Okay. So both types of substitutions. So every substitution reaction. involves at least two of the four patterns of reactivity. So the patterns of reactivity are from chapter six. Okay. Right, so we're gonna, the patterns are Loss of the leaving group, that has to occur in a substitution reaction, as well as a nucleophilic attack. Now you may have proton transfers and you may have rearrangements, but they're not required in a substitution mechanism. These two are absolutely, uh, absolutely required. Okay, so I'm going to put it in the box. Okay. Okay. All right, so if the two steps, and that's referring to these two in the box, occur simultaneously, So that's at the same time. Okay. In one single reaction step, so maybe we should say if the two patterns occur simultaneously. So you have a simultaneous nucleophilic attack as the leaving group is leaving. Those are called SN2 reactions. So one step SN2. If the two patterns 
occur in series, which means one at a time, minus the leaving group, then nucleophilic attack, in two separate steps, then you call it an SN1 reaction. Okay. So two separate steps, SN1. Okay. Now this is, we'll, I'll have to erase this and go to the second slide. These names, SN1 and SN2, are based on kinetics and the rate laws for the reaction. Okay. So when you look at those names, you have to think of the kinetics and not the number of steps. So a one step is an SN2, two steps is SN1. Are there any questions about this part before we look at the kinetics that separates these two reactions? <coughs> what? And for right now, we're going to do just sort of a simpler um, analysis of it, and we can talk about it more when we get into looking at individual mechanisms. All right, so how are the substitution names? So SN1, SN2 related to kinetics. All right, so first we'll start with the SN2 reaction. Okay, SN2 is one step involving simultaneous loss of the leaving group and nucleophilic attack. Okay. Now, loss of the leaving group, that part of the of the um, reaction that is happening with the substrate because the leaving group is on the substrate. Nucleophilic attack involves the nucleophile. So the reaction depends on a collision of two chemical species. The substrate and the nucleophile. Okay. That step is the slow step in the reaction. The slow step is used to build the rate law. So the rate law for SN2 reactions is that the rate of the reaction is going to be equal to a rate constant times the substrate concentration times the nucleophile concentration. Okay. If you increase the concentration of the substrate, the reaction will go faster. If you increase the amount of the nucleophile present, the uh, reaction will go faster. Okay, so the rate depends on both of the concentrations and depends on a collision. Okay. So what SN2 means is substitution 
by nucleophilic attack with bimolecularity. Molecularity means how many of molecules, how many molecules participate in the rate determining step. So bi means two. So this is telling you that a substitution by nucleophilic attack involving two molecules. So that's why there's a two up here. Substitution by nucleophilic attack using two molecules in one single step. All right, so can I erase most of this and then do the same for SN1? So SN1 reactions, these are two steps where you have the loss of the leaving group then nucleophilic attack. So the first step is the loss of the leaving group. This is step one. Okay. Step one is the slow step. The reaction rate depends on how quickly the leaving group leaves. Okay. It has nothing to do with the nucleophile. It's dependent only on the substrate's loss of the leaving group. So the rate law for an SN1 reaction is that the rate of the reaction is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the substrate. So if you want an SN1 reaction to go faster, you increase the concentration of the substrate. You can increase the concentration of the nucleophile all you want, but that won't affect the rate. So only one molecule participates in the rate law. So this is a substitution by nucleophilic attack with unimolecularity. Molec. Okay, so one molecule impacts the rate of substitution by nucleophilic attack. So this one molecule is why there's a one here. Okay, so the two different rate laws will distinguish the substitution reactions. So substrate times nucleophile, that's SN2, rate is dependent only on the substrate, that's SN1. Okay. So when you write these things down, and you have, you know, you're taking notes, or you're getting ready to take your exam, and you're allowed to start writing, you start that exam, these things get written down on your paper. One step, two steps. The biggest issue people have with keeping these things separate is that they use the two to determine the number of steps instead of using the two to determine the kinetics. So this, if these things get switched, the whole thing is going to be a disaster. So we're going to start with SN2 reactions and then go into some of the details, especially with the substrate, with how to determine 
whether a substate will participate in an SN2, but we're going to start with SN2s. Okay, so this is 7.4. Which is the SN2 mechanism. And then this would link back to 6.6 because .6, we're going to use an energy level diagram. And we've talked about a lot of this stuff that will feed into this yesterday when we did that um, thermo and kinetics review. So with our SN2 mechanism, again, we're always going to write down our rate law. The two means the molecularity. And then we have our nucleophile. Okay. It's bimolecular in one step. Okay, so the one step tells you that on your energy level diagram, energy versus progress, one step reactions have a single bump, a single hill. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw it on a potential energy axis, reactants going to products. Now remember, um, if you have a loss of energy, typically the height of the highest peak of the hill will be closer to the reactant side, not closer to the product side. Okay. okay. This point up here, again, is a transition state. The structure is proposed using Hammond's postulate. Okay, you cannot isolate the transition state. The ability to form the transition state depends on the height of the activation energy. The higher this hill, the less likely this reaction will take place. Okay. Questions so far before we look at the mechanism? Okay. Well, I'm going to erase the activation energy or this energy level diagram. Okay. Now, one of the things that is important in identifying what happens is an SN2 mechanism is by using stereochemistry to monitor the reaction path or the reaction mechanism. Okay, so what that means is we're going to use a chiral substrate in order to perform an SN2 reaction and then we'll use a simpler model. Okay. So our chiral carbon is this dot and on this dot we're going to have a bromine atom which is going to be our leading group. And then I'm going to use some abbreviations just to make this diagram a little bit simpler. So ET is the shortcut symbol for ethyl. ME is the, sub, is the shortcut for methyl. And then we have hydrogen here. Okay. Now we can go quickly through and do the stereochemistry. Bromine would be one with the highest atomic number. Hydrogen would be four. The first group off the chiral carbon would be a, a carbon for the methyl and a carbon for the ethyl. 
The hydrogen has HHH attached to it. The first carbon in ethyl has HHC. So the ethyl group is two, the methyl group is three. Okay. Now the hydrogen is in the wrong place. It's coming up instead of back. So whatever I read is opposite the actual chirality. So this looks like it's R, but since the hydrogen is on the wedge instead of the dash, this is a S stereochemistry substrate. Okay. Now I'm going to react it with that file. And when I allow the reaction to proceed, the product that you see and measure and study looks like this. So you have your SH group, your hydrogen group has been pushed forward, your methyl group has been pushed from the back, or for, sorry, from the left side of the molecule to the right, as well as the ethyl. Okay, okay sorry. And then the bromide gets thrown out. If we do the stereochemistry here, the thiol would be one, hydrogen four, ethyl by the same analysis we did here would be two, Three, hydrogen is in the wrong place. It's on the wedge instead of the dash. So when we read this as S, it's really R. And this is R stereochemistry. So what this is telling you is in the course of this reaction, you have 100% or complete inversion of stereochemistry. So if you have the slides in front of you, you see this kind of sort of funny picture of um, the second George Bush. But what I want you to consider, this is not going to look, I did not major in art, okay? So what I want you to consider is that this is an umbrella, okay? It used to be scalloped when I was little, okay? So you have an umbrella. Okay, which is your substrate. Okay, the nucleophile comes in. This is going to be the front. This is going to be the back. The nucleophile comes in from the back and pushes like wind into your umbrella. And what happens? and this has happened to everybody, is that your umbrella inverts, okay? Because the nucleophile is coming from the back and it's gonna force the umbrella to flip upside, inside out, okay? So it's a complete inversion. That's what's happening up here. This thiol is gonna come from this side. and come towards this chiral carbon here, which is going to cause all of these groups, this is your umbrella, to invert over here. So if you kind of draw it, like the umbrella would be like this, and then your umbrella is like this. Okay, so it inverts, okay. The only way you get complete inversion is if your subs, your nucleophile comes in at the back of the molecule while the leaving group leaves. So then as this thiol comes in, this bromine is going to start coming off. Okay. This step of the nucleophile coming in from the back is referred to 
as a backside attack. Okay, so all SN2 mechanisms that occur, occur in a one step backside attack from the nucleophile onto the substrate to cause complete inversion of your molecule. Okay, so if your substrate is S, your product will be R. Your substrate is R, your product will be S. This will, you will only see the inversion in stereochemistry if you have a secondary substrate. Okay, if you have a different type of substrate on this mechan on your substrate, you won't see this. But this is the evidence for one step by backside attack. Are there any um, questions about this before we start looking at a um, a simpler example. Okay. Right, so now we're going to look at a simpler SN2 reaction. Okay. So from the last slide, what you know has to happen is that you know the nucleophile must attack the partially positive carbon that's bonded to the leaving group from the back. Okay, that is an essential part of the reaction. What that means is that Carbons bonded to leaving groups that are, we're going to just say, more exposed or more open participate best in SN2 reactions. Okay, and then I need to write this in green, so it's green for go. Okay, and so what that means is that methyl and primary substrates participate readily in SN2 reactions. And I'll, we'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. So I'm just going to use a methyl substrate because it's easier to draw. Okay, so I'm going to draw my chloride now on this backside just for simplicity. And I'm going to draw my substrate. like this, okay? So the substrate has a bromine as a leaving group, and I need the chloride to come in from the back side, 180 degrees from the bromine. So the way that this mechanism is drawn is the chloride lone pair are going to attack the carbon that's partially positive, at the same time that the bromide leaves with the sigma bond electrons. Okay. Now we know that this is a single step reaction. That's going to go through a transition state, which we can draw but it's going to be a proposal. Now, when you draw a transition state, you have to draw it in brackets. Okay. The bond here, this means sigma bond form, while sigma bond breaks. So the way I would draw this 
is that the chloride is starting to make a bond to carbon that's starting to break a bond to bromine with these hydrogens in place. I'm not saying that I have a five coordinate carbon. I'm saying that this isn't a full bond and this isn't a full bond. Okay. Now, because this species is my proposal based on Hammond's postulate at the transition state, I put a double dagger on the outside. Okay. So this is proposed. by Hammond's postulate. If I had proposed the structure here, this bond would be formed even more. This bond would be broken even more. If I picked a place over here, this bond would be formed less. This would be more like a normal sigma bond. Then what happens is you would draw your final product where you would have chloride now attached to that carbon with the hydrogens. Oops. And then we would have the bromide gone in the trash. So now we're going to talk, if there aren't any questions about this, we're going to go and talk a little bit more about these methyl and primary substrates. Okay. So this will be SN2 and structure of the substrate. So as we've said, the SN2 reaction is in one step in which we need our nucleophile to attack from the back the partially positive carbon with the leaving group while the leaving group is leaving. So we need an accessible, partially positive carbon. Okay. So now I'm, we're going to draw a set of substrates. So there's a methyl substrate. Primary, mm, let me draw that over right here. And then tertiary. Okay, so methyl, primary secondary, tertiary, okay? Now what I want you to do is on your methyls, I want you to draw a box. And the box is going to essentially be space filling and showing you the relative amount of space the methyl group will occupy relative to a hydrogen. And in each case, what we're trying to do is get the nucleophile at the red carbon. Okay. 
So this red carbon is open. You could have, and remember you have free rotation and stuff. So this is an accessible carbon, more accessible than this carbon. The methyl carbon is more accessible than a secondary carbon, which is more accessible than a tertiary carbon. Okay. So reactivity in SN2 goes in this direction. These are the most reactive. These are the least reactive. Okay. So what we're going to, how I'm going to label these is with the colors of a um, tap and go light. Okay. Go. These will go by SN2. Always. They will never go by SN1. Primary, that's a go for SN2. Tertiary, stop. They will never go by SN2. Okay. Now, depending on where you're from and how old you are, the orange or the yellow light <laughs> For old people, it means caution. For this case, use caution. Don't mean, that doesn't mean just, my kid says send it, don't send it, okay? Use caution, okay? Because SN2 reactions can, or sorry, secondary substrates can perform SN2 substitutions, but they also can perform <laughs> SN1 substitutions. Okay, so you always have to stop and think about secondaries. But if you see a primary or a methyl, it's always SN2. Tertiary, it's never SN2. Okay, so what I would like for you to do on your own is I would like for you to practice drawing the arrows for um, the following SN2 reaction. Now this is called a nitrile, okay? And even though there are electrons on both sides, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. And it is actually neutral in this, in terms of formal charge. It's making three bonds and carrying one lone pair. The carbon is being forced to carry a lone pair and a negative charge. So the carbon end here, <coughs> the nucleophilic site. Okay. And I want you to draw the arrows where it reacts. With this, oops substrate.
So in this reaction, the lone pair of electrons from the carbon atom in the nitrile attack the carbon from the backside while the bromine leaves. You don't have to draw a transition state if you don't want to because it's proposed anyway. Like that. Okay. Any other questions? Or any questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, when, so I notice on the product, both of, since all of the, oh, there goes my dog, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Since all of the H's are on, they're on different things. If those were different, like if one of those was a methyl group, would we have to flip to have one be on the wedge or one be on the dash? No, no, no. No, no. no. okay. No, um, let me see. I know I have an example of, okay, here, here's one. Well, actually, let me, it, a lot of it's going to depend on how it's, how it's drawn. So here's an example. This isn't, okay, so like this. And then we're going to attack it with thiol. Okay. So, let's see, one, four, two, three, so this is R. Okay. So when this thing attacks, now in this case, it's not drawn like this. So in this case, like I have the leaving group in plane and now, and not shown with stereochemistry, but now the the bromine is coming at you on that dash. So in order to show backside attack, you have to kind of come in like this towards that carbon, okay? To me, if you come in you, like this, it's coming at the front, to me. But it's, it's harder, it's not wrong, it just looks funny to me. Okay. And then what you would draw since the thiol is coming in from the back, then the thiol has to end up on the back. And the result is that it pushes the hydrogen forward. And then when you do the stereochemistry, it looks R, but since the hydrogen is front instead of back, it's S. So the only time it's really going to matter as to how you draw your substrate, pro your product, is if your reactant is chiral. Like this isn't chiral. So it doesn't matter really where you put your hydrogens over here, because you aren't being, you aren't required to draw a product with the correct stereochemistry. But in this case, since I'm drawing it going by SN2, I have to invert the stereochemistry. So I would have to be sure I drew the right product. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question. Sure, Ben. Um, so for the nitrile one, mm -hmm. um, that's the SN2 backside attack. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that one also invert? Well, it does. But because this is not chiral, you're not going to have any evidence that it did a backside attack. So the, the, the key to distinguishing the mechanisms is if you use a secondary substrate, that's chiral. If you get 100% inversion, it means SN2 had to happen. If you end up with a racemic mixture, that means you had to have an SN1 reaction. But you can measure 
a molecule's ability to perform a substitution reaction. So, um, for example, if we have a methyl substrate, primary, secondary, tertiary, and we set our conditions so that we are forcing SN2, and you can do that. You can force SN2 by um, how you pick your nucleophile and how you pick your solvent which we're, we're getting to, but we'll just say, just believe me right now that I can pick a, pick a nucleophile and a specific solvent so that the only mechanism that is possible would be SN2, okay? So if I draw an energy level diagram for each one of these, what I would see is I have a little activation energy here, so it will go by SN1, or sorry, SN2. A higher activation energy, but still pretty fast, SN2. Secondary, it's getting a little higher, but you can still make it go by SN2. The tertiary is gonna be like that, where that activation energy is so high, the reaction will never proceed. So since the secondary is the way you can distinguish the reactions and you know by energy level diagrams that these two have to go by SN2. If a secondary goes by SN2 and you get inversion, then you would get inversion in the methyl and primary, but you can't tell because there's no stereochemistry to measure or to monitor. that makes so let me um, make a model real quick okay so this is a methyl I can't see myself right now Okay, so this is, that looks horrible, a methyl substrate, okay? The red is the leading group. Green's gonna come in, and we're gonna make a new bond. So now the substrate would look, the product would look like this. But this product is gonna tumble and spin, and eventually it'll look, it'll be in this orientation. And that's exactly what it had been like in the beginning. So I can't tell on a methyl substrate or a primary substrate that I've inverted the stereochemistry because of how the molecule had, can freely move and tumble in the solvent. So I can't measure the inversion. It's only if I use a secondary substrate that I can measure the inversion and know the way in which the nucleophile had to attack from the back. Does that make more sense, Ben? Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Now, one of the things that you may not have noticed, because I didn't say anything about it, is that up until this point, the nucleophiles I've chosen would be drawn as a nucleophile with a lone pair and a negative charge. So nitrile is negative charge, methyl is negative charge. This, when we use the chlorine to attack, it was negative charge. Hydroxide is not a very good nucleophile, so I try not to use it as much um, as possible, but um, there are nucleophiles that are negatively charged, okay? 
when you have a nucleophile that's negatively charged in an SN2 reaction, this is all you have to draw. Okay, this species, this nitrile, the source of the nitrile is a salt. So I would put like sodium, it would be sodium cyanide at that point. But in order to get this group, I would put in a salt. The cation is useless. It doesn't do anything. But it gives you this group in the reaction mixture for the substitution reaction to take place. Okay. But you can use a neutral nucleophile. Something that would be written just as NU with electrons. Okay. So, for example, what if I take one iodopropane, which is a primary alkyl halide, so I don't have chirality issues here. So, one iodopropane. And I'm going to react it with, I'm going to put it up here just for ease with this uh, nucleophile. Now solvents always go at the bottom. Nucleophiles can go on the top of the arrow. Okay. The entire nucleophile will attack. You can't just lose a proton because you want to have a negative charge. You'd have to use the neutral nucleophile as is kick off the iodine and you'd end up with this species. Okay. Hardest part about these reactions is that when you write them, it is it deceptively tells you, or, you, or I think, that, okay, well, you have one molecule of one iodopropane and you have one molecule of nucleophile. That's not true. You have tons of molecules. So when you end up with a species that looks like this, you end up having to do a proton transfer reaction and you just use another molecule of your, um, Nucleophile, you just deprotonate like this to make your actual product. These two things are garbage, but this is your product. Okay, so if you use a neutral nucleophile, you must do a separate deprotonation at the end. You can't do the deprotonation early. Okay. The reason you can't is that this species, the deprotonation reaction is reactant favored. So this is the dominant species for that acid base proton transfer at equilibrium. Okay. If you used water here, same thing. You would deprotonate at the end. Okay. Right. Are there questions about either of those two SN2 reaction mechanisms, the ones that are one step and don't have a deprotonation, or those that do have a deprotonation? Okay. All right. So we're going to go back now and we're going to sort of do the same sort of introduction for SN1. Talking about, again, how do we know what's going on? How do we use stereochemistry to help us? 
and then we'll talk about substrates and then we'll move on into the other features that we can use. So this is 7.5, the SN1 mechanism. Okay. And this links to 6.6, .6, which is energy level diagrams. So SN1 reactions have a rate law where the rate is equal to K times the concentration of the substrate only. Okay. And what that means is that the rate determining step is the loss of the leaving group from your substrate. So how quickly, and I'm just going to write substrate LG, this will leave with electrons to form your substrate plus a leaving group. The substrate is going to be, all the time, a carbocation. In, this is step one. Step two, to form product. Step two is nucleophilic attack. Okay, so nucleophilic attack cannot occur until you have already formed a carbocation, which is considered a reaction intermediate. Okay, so our energy level diagram, which is two steps, is going to have two bumps. The slow step is the first step, the loss of the leaving group. So this has to have a higher activation energy or a higher hill than the nucleophilic attack. Reactants, products, carbocation. Slow step, which is the loss of the leaving group. Okay. Okay. So when we, if we just think a little bit about where we're going in advance, our substrate has to end up making a carbocation. Okay, so carbocations though, can be methyl carbocations, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Stability increases in this direction. Okay. So the stability of the carbocation dictates the types of substrates that can perform SN1 reactions. So we have to think about the structure, and we have to think about, will this rearrange before we go ahead to propose our product? Questions about that before? This is kind of how we did the introduction to SN2, and now we're going to look at the stereo specificity or the stereochemistry that supports the SN1 two step reaction. Okay. So, SN1. 
using stereochemistry to support the mechanism. Okay. Now, if we're going to use stereochemistry, turn my ear itches, to support the mechanism, we need a chiral substrate. Okay. The only way the reaction, or the only way you can have a chiral substrate is if you use a secondary or a tertiary substrate. So we know that tertiary substrates are going to make tertiary carbocations, which are stable. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to use a tertiary substrate that's chiral. Okay. So here's our carbo chiral carbon okay. with a leaving group. And again, I'm just going to use shortcuts. So ethyl, methyl, propyl. One, two, three, four. So this is S. Now the first step of an SN1 reaction is the loss of a leaving group. So the bromine will leave as bromide by taking the lone, sorry, the bonded pair of electrons in that sigma bond with it. Now you have to draw the structure of the tertiary carbocation intermediate. Intermediates can be isolated. There are, there is data to support the structure of carbocations. So we're going to end up with a propyl. I'm, going to, I'm drawing it this way for a specific reason, and I'll tell you in just a minute. Methyl, ethyl. Okay. This carbon here is sp3 hybridized. This carbon here is sp2 hybridized. So this part of the molecule um, is trigonal planar. It has an unhybridized P orbital on that central carbocation, or sorry, that central carbon that's carrying the carbocation. So this is unhybridized P, those two colors. It's an atomic P orbital. Okay. So now I'm going to bring in a chloride. Okay. The chloride, you see it's a Lewis base. It's an electron pair donor. And it has to find a Lewis acid that has an empty orbital. Okay. But there's two lobes of a P orbital. So 50% of the attack by chloride will occur in this lobe. 50% of the attack will occur in the red lobe, which means you're going to end up with products, propyl, methyl, ethyl, that are racemic. 
you get a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. This cannot happen through backside attack. It can only happen if you go through a carbocation intermediate that has two lobes, each equally likely to accept um, electron density. This will has, has optical activity. Your racemic mixture has no optical activity because it's racemic. If you separate the enantiomers, they would each have optical activity. One is R and one is S. Oh, you can't see the chlorine over there. There you go. So this attack that's shown here, attack is equally likely or equally probable into each lobe. Okay. There are questions about that. Okay, so let's look at the substrates, which at this point should be a pretty um, pretty much a just a review if you sort of understood what I was saying. So this is identity of substrate. Okay. So we have to write them all out again. So we have a methyl substrate. primary substrate, secondary, and then tertiary. Okay. And for SM1, its ability to form a cation or a carbocation. The order is reversed relative to SN2. These are not reactive, or you could say low reactivity. These are very high reactivity by SN1. So again, if we use our stop and go light colors, this is a stop. It won't go by SN1. Stop. It won't go by SN1. Tertiary, that's a go. SN1. And again, for secondary, you have to use caution because you can go SN1 or SN2 depending on other factors. There is a slide in your text, which I can't, or text and in the notes that are online that I can't duplicate on here. It's a electrostatic potential energy map, which is showing you why tertiary carbocations are more stable. Um, it, it basically has to do with the number of carbon atoms that can support or contribute to stabilizing the positive charge. The more carbons you have attached to the carbocation, carbon, the more stable that species will be. Okay, so we're going to do, if there aren't any questions, we're going to do some practicing of the um, reaction mechanisms. And then we'll start kind of summarizing. We're making really good, really good time. All right, so 
I'm going to draw the same mechanism twice just to show you uh, some slight differences in the way that um, things can be written. So we're going to just, this is 7.6, drawing a complete SN1 mechanism. And honestly, even though you're not going to have to write for me a mechanism, I encourage you to practice writing these mechanisms because if you have to take 212 and you take it in a regular term where there will be sit down exams, you're gonna to have to know how to write all these steps. Okay, so the SN1 reaction we have to remember is two steps. Okay. So the first thing we're going to look at is how the nucleophile might be shown. Okay. So we're just gonna use a real simple tertiary alkyl halide. We're gonna lose the leaving group to make our carbocation intermediate and we have our iodine trash, okay? Then we're going to have our thiol, which will attack, now this isn't chiral, it's tertiary, but it's not chiral, because these are all methyls. So when you draw your product, it doesn't really matter how you draw it. Okay. All right. So it could be shown as an anion. The other way that you can show the same reaction is to show that as a salt. So when you have a salt, what you get is a cation and the anion. The cation is useless, okay? Which is why up here, I didn't even bother to show it. But if you see it written as a salt, break the salt into ions and use the anion only. And you'll get your product. And then you would have your trash, iodide, and sodium. This should be iodide here somewhere. Okay. The reason I'm showing you this is that there's another way you can see like an SH component, H2S. Okay. You can't break this up. Okay. Because it's a weak acid. And the equilibrium is favored towards this product. You can use it as a nucleophile. But since it's neutral, neutral nucleophiles require a deprotonation step, okay? So let me write that out and show you what I mean, and then I'll give you some practice. So if instead I put H2S in, okay? lose my leaving group, make my carbocation, Attack my carbocation. Make my protonated product. Okay. 
deprotonate it. And I end up, you can see, I end up with the same things. It's just drawn in different ways based on the source of my nucleophile. So it's important that you recognize when you have a negative nucleophile versus a neutral nucleophile. Anytime you use a neutral nucleophile, you must deprotonate separately at the end. Let me write in my counter ions. There we go, H3S plus. That's supposed to be an I. Okay. Are there any questions before I give you a simple example and then like this, and then I'll show you a couple different, slightly harder examples. I just got a notification that my internet connection is unstable. So if we have a problem, I'm sorry. No questions? Okay. So what I want you to practice doing is I want you to take This substrate, okay. and I want you to use acetate, and I want you to do an SM1 reaction. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Does anybody need more time? Lose your leading group. Show your carbocation. You can leave them up here if you want to. Attack your carbocation. And then you have a product. And if you take very long. what I want you to notice though is you've done a functional group transformation. You took an alkyl halide and you've made an ester. Okay. So 
when you're using or studying these things, what I want you to remember always is that you have IR and mass spec data that can support this reaction taking place. Because in the product, you would have a carbonyl stretch in the IR that you don't have in the reactant. In the reactant, you could, if you didn't know the identity of the halide, you could use IR to see a three to one ratio here. So there's a lot of little pieces that you kind of have to keep cycling back through um, as you work through this um, material. The next, and I think this will be the last example that I give you um, before we move on, because we've already done the mechanism with the proton transfer, is a reaction that involves a rearrangement. Okay, so this is a more complicated um, substrate, but still the principles are the same. Okay, so we're good. This is a secondary substrate, a secondary alkyl halide. Okay, and I'm just going to have chloride in here so we don't have to worry about a proton transfer. Okay. And I'm going to just, we haven't gotten there yet, but I'm, I would pick a solvent because it's secondary and could do both an SN1, SN2 reaction. I would pick a solvent that would force this reaction to go in an SN1 um, pathway. So I'm going to lose my leaving group. And then what I would get would be a secondary carbocation intermediate. Okay. Now, even though in the reaction container, the reaction proceeds and you can't stop the reaction here. When you draw it on paper, you can stop the reaction, at least in your head and consider does performing a shift at one of those carbon positions next door to the carbocation, does that form a more stable carbocation? If the carbocation moves here, it becomes primary. If we do a methyl shift here, the reaction or the carbocation would be tertiary. And so that's what will happen. You would see a methyl shift to the carbocation, and you would form this species. The chloride then, this is still a chiral, the chloride will attack. the carbocation. And create that product. Okay. Now, some students ask, is there a chance, everything's probability, is there a probability that the chloride would attack the secondary carbocation? Yes, you can have this thing immediately go to product. Okay. But this would be considered the major product. This would be considered a minor product. Okay. The reason that this is major and this is minor is because this step, okay, just say A versus B, A is faster B is slower. A is faster because it involves one molecule undergoing a rearrangement. B is slower because it requires a collision between this secondary carbocation and a chloride. So it's, it has a bimolecularity, so two molecules involved. So anything that, that, any step that requires more than one molecule is going to be slower than something that can happen intramolecularly like this. Okay. 
questions before we sort of summarize what we've done so far? Okay, this is great timing. Okay, so we're gonna move now into 7.8. which is starting to think about determining which mechanism dominates. Okay. Now, the reason that it's important, so that's what we have to do. Why do we care? Why does it really matter which mechanism dominates as long as you have a substitution reaction that takes place? The first is that the type of mechanism that precedes impacts the stereochemistry of your product. If you have an SN2 reaction take place, you get inversion, complete inversion. SN1, you get that racemization or the formation of a racemic mixture. So if we go by, if you consider that with respect to that drug thalidomide that we talked about last week in the discussion, what if the last step was an SN1 reaction and it created a racemic mixture of enantiomers that were then sold and caused birth defects. What if that reaction could have gone by SN2 and you only had created a drug that had the beneficial enantiomer? So just the pathway that you pick could have an impact on the presence or absence of a harmful enantiomer. So it's really important to know which mechanism pathway is taking place. The second is that when you perform this reaction, you have always a potential for carbocation rearrangement, which you may want and you may not want that. You may be able to use that to your advantage or it'll hinder your reaction from taking place the way you want it to. If you do an SN2 reaction, carbocation rearrangement is impossible because it doesn't involve a carbocation at all. But in SN1 reactions, you have to expect it'll take place. And you have to plan for that step to take place when you're developing your, your whole um, synthesis plan. So when you determine which reaction mechanism will dominate, the easiest place to start is the substrate. Okay. And like I said, we can we've done this methyl primary secondary, tertiary, methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay. If this set is for SN2, this set is for SN1. SN2 is a one-step backside attack. Go, go, stop, caution. For SN1, it's a two step, you have to be able to make a carbocation. Go, stop, stop. Caution. Okay. So sometimes just the substrate alone will be enough to lead you to picking SN2 over SN1. 
Okay. Now there are a group of substrates. that can do both SN1 and SN2. Those would be the allylic, because it has this sp3 carbon with a leaving group that could be primary, so it's open for backside attack. But if the leaving group left, you would end up with an, a an allylic carbocation that's resonance stabilized. Or benzylic. Benzylic also has this open carbon for backside attack, but if the leaving group left, you would have a resonance stabilized carbocation charge. The two that do neither SN1 nor SN2 look very similar. The vinylic and the aryl. The carbon that you have to attack is in a ring or is vinylic. They won't participate in um, backside attack and vinylic and aryl carbocations are not stable. Okay. Are there any questions about how to use the substrate to determine your mechanism? So that's um, where we will stop today. And when we come back tomorrow, oh wait, Friday, that's right. Come back Monday, we're going to, um, we probably will get through a good bit of the end. We might finish seven on Monday and then we'll review for the exam and then we'll pick up with chapter eight Tuesday. Can't believe how fast it's going. Okay. If there aren't any questions, then we'll just, we will end for today and I'll put the Zoom notes up as soon as I get them. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. I'll talk to you all. Um, if you need anything over the weekend, let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk to you on Monday. Yes, the exam will open at the same time. If that's an issue for anybody, please let me know. Thank you for class. Yep, no problem. Talk to y'all later.